Welcome to the Indian Council of Worldest Foreign Policy Think Tank. Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001 when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world, encompassing the domain of area studies. The council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India, an Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change, and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy, and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now, this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I, for many years, have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public-funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. It, it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, on behalf of the Indian Council of World Affairs, welcome you all for this two-day virtual international conference 
on Kiyam Panikkar and the growth of a maritime consciousness in India. The conference will be conducted over four technical sessions and a panel discussion later in the day tomorrow. Over the course of the two days, we aim to discuss and deliberate on certain key issues, including on Panikkar's life and works, evolution of maritime consciousness in India, and different phases of Atlantic and Pacific power dominance in the Indian Ocean, and the relevance of Panikkar's ideas in the context of Indo-Pacific construct. ICWA has taken this opportunity to bring together eminent experts and scholars on the subject. The objective is to facilitate a better understanding of India's maritime past and the emerging geopolitical scenarios in the Indian Ocean region and its implications for India. I take this opportunity to welcome our, all our distinguished speakers and August audience who have joined us from different locations across India as well as from other countries. Uh, with this, uh, uh, may I now request uh, DGICWA Dr. T. C. A. Raghavan to kindly deliver his opening remarks. Good morning, dear friends. Uh, Sardar K. M. Panikkar's life and works form. Dear friends, good morning. Very nice to be present with all of you on this platform. Sardar K. M. Panikkar's life, life and works form a fascinating narrative, encompassing a wide diversity of roles positions and interests. His contributions in different capacities as a diplomat, as a historian, as a statesman and a journalist are of immense significance and merit closer study for any close understanding of the diplomatic and intellectual history of modern India. Now, this seminar unfortunately is virtual, although we had uh, expected and hoped at one time that we would be able to meet in person. Uh, this seminar is a small step uh, towards that wider understanding of K.M. Patikar's life and works. By way of declaration of interest, I should also say that Sadat Patikar was closely associated with the Indian Council of World Affairs in the late 1940s and early 1950s, and I'll come to that uh, at the end of my remarks. Panikkar was one of the early writers on the history of India's connections with the Indian Ocean. Uh, his seminal historical and literary works have influenced contemporary thought and perceptions and played a formative role in orienting independent India's maritime consciousness. His major works left an, a deep imprint on India's maritime strategy. And very briefly, I can list these as Asia and Western Dominance, his classic work of 1953, India and the Indian Ocean, an essay on the influence of sea power on Indian history in 1945, and the strategic problems of the Indian Ocean in 1944. His works focus on tracing the influence of the Indian Ocean, which he considers as, quote, the first center of oceanic activity on shaping Indian history and on examining the vital importance of oceanic or maritime control on Indian history and India's future. Padikar argued that what he called the peninsular character of India and dependence for its trade on maritime traffic give, gives the sea a preponderant influence on its destiny. He criticized a one-sided view of India's security with an exclusive focus on the northwestern frontiers, overlooked, overlooking the maritime, despite the oceans having had an important and significant place in Indian thinking and oceanic navigation having been common to the coastal inhabitants of peninsular India for several millennia. His classic work, Asia and Western Dominance, had, had demonstrated that for a period of about 450 years, from the arrival of Vasco de Gama to Calicut in 1498, this period, in his view, had comprised and Vasco de Gama a talk of Indian history. This was marked by a singular unity in its fundamental aspect, which was the dominance of European maritime power over the landmass of Asia. Thus, in his view, the battles of Duke and Cochin were more significant 
for having changed the course of Indian history than the better known battles of Plassey and Buxar. His Malabar and the Portuguese particularly focused on the history of Portuguese interactions in the region and their social and political influences. The different phases and geographies of the European power balance, Portuguese, Dutch, French, and British, had deeply interested Panikkar and remains of interest to this day in view of their differential and massive impact on subsequent Asian geopolitics. Panikkar recognized that his own time marked the end of the so-called Atlantic phase of Indian Ocean's history. He described the growth of two powerful naval powers based in the Pacific, i.e. Japan and the United States, and how this revolutionized naval competition in the Indian Ocean. From an analytical perspective, his description of competition amongst the extra-regional powers also provides a backdrop to analyze the contemporary intense geopolitical churn in the Indian Ocean as also the wider Indo-Pacific region. When we re-engage with his writings today, I think it is important to recognize how clearly Panikkar saw the shift in the history of the Indian Ocean from the Atlantic phase to its Pacific phase, and really the term Indo-Pacific in many ways comprises the core of that thinking and really is what led to us and of conceiving this seminar. Panikkar had emphasized the need for a well-considered and effective naval policy as pertinent to India's security. He wrote, quote, India never lost her independence till she lost the command of the sea in the first decade of the 16th century, unquote. Panikkar's own thought process needs to be given greater credit because from an earlier preoccupation with a continental mindset in the country's strategic calculus, there is now a gradually growing equivalence in the country's strategic fraternity between the continental and the maritime as the Indian Ocean becomes one of the primary priorities of Indian foreign policy. This two-day virtual conference aims at bringing together foreign and Indian experts and scholars to ponder on issues, including on the relevance of Panikkar's work, works to facilitate a better understanding of India's maritime past, the evolution of Indian maritime strategy, and emerging geopolitical equations in the Indian Ocean region in the context of the expanded maritime geography of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I would like to say that in conceiving and designing the seminar, we have been assisted greatly and guided throughout by a number of scholars. And I would like to mention in particular, Professor Pais Malakan, the Nathil of Jawaharlal Nehru University, Professor KMCT, KMCT of Calicut University, Professor Himanshu Prabhare, formerly of Jawaharlal Nehru University and formerly chairperson of the National Monument Authority, uh, Dr. Vijay Sakuja and Professor Sanjay Baru, uh, who is chair of the program committee of the Indian Council of World uh, Affairs. I had referred to in the beginning to Panikkar's close association with the Indian Council of World Affairs in the 1940s and early 1950s. One of his contributions to the working of a still nascent council in those years was to impart this idea that it was essential to create interdisciplinary platforms to study any particular subject of import. Uh, our aim in bringing together in this conference ancient and medieval historians, uh, geopolitical strategists, naval analysts, and others was precisely to create that kind of multidisciplinary uh, platform. And we do hope that this endeavor will lead to similar efforts in the future also. Uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today for this two-day virtual conference on Panikkar and the growth of a maritime consciousness in India. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your remarks. 
Uh, with this, uh, uh, we shall now begin with the first session, which is on KM Panikar, Life and Works. For the session, we have Dr. Sebastian Pranch as the moderator and commentator for the session. Dr. Pranch is the Associate Professor, Department of History, University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Among the speakers, we have with us Professor Himanshu Prabhare, former chairperson, National Monuments Authority of India. Dr. Patrick Bratton, Associate Professor, National Security Strategy, U.S. Army War College. Dr. Raghul V. Rajan, Assistant Professor, Aligarh Muslim University Center, Malapuram, Kerala. Professor M.H. Ilyas, who is the last speaker, unfortunately, he won't be able to join us due to his health conditions. So before we begin the session formally, certain house rules, uh, all the participants are requested to mute themselves when they are not speaking. Questions can be asked during the discussion round. Panelists can ask questions by raise hand option and the registered participants can ask questions live by typing through the chat box. In case any of the speakers are facing connectivity issue, they may switch off the camera and continue on the audio mode. May I now invite Dr. Pranj to conduct the proceedings uh, for the session. Dr. Pranj, over to you. Thank you very much. And my thanks, of course, to the Indian Council of World Affairs for putting together this, this wonderful, wonderful two-day event. Um, I'm at quite a time difference here in Vancouver, Canada, but I will try to attend as, as many of the proceedings as I possibly can. And they all seem to be so fascinating. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we okay. can hear you. Wonderful. Then um, I uh, invite our first speaker, our very uh, distinguished speaker on this panel, Professor Hemantra Ray. As was just mentioned, she is a former chairperson of the National Monuments Authority and a former professor at the Center for Historical Studies at JNU. Um, she has, over a distinguished career, received innumerable honors and awards and produced countless publications, including multiple monographs on marine archaeology, different aspects of seafaring and trade, and on cross-cultural exchange across the Indian Ocean. So it's my great honor to invite Professor Ray to speak to us about K.M. Panika, the historian, history as maritime geostrategy. Um, Professor Ray, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prange, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the DG um, ICWA, JS ICWA, and of course, Pragya uh, Pandey, who has worked uh, so hard to, to bring all of us together. Um, I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, I have slides to share with you. And um, as we heard from uh, the DG, um, uh, Panikar was um, indeed a multifaceted personality, but my um, uh, my uh, concern and um, uh, what I'm going to talk about will be essentially with Panikar, the historian. Um, so I'm looking at just one aspect of K.M. Panikar, um, and uh, that's only the maritime history aspect. And the second question that I have, and the second question that I'd like to address here, is um, the whole relationship between the past and the present, and whether um, history, which essentially concerns the past, um, can be used um, for the present, can be used for geo strategies, which are current geo strategies, which really relate to the present. So these are my two objectives. The first one being to highlight uh, the role of uh, Panikar. Uh, as a maritime historian, and you know, he wrote many, many books, and I don't think I can cover uh, very many of them in this uh, short uh, time that I have. I will only talk about his books on maritime history. And the second, of course, as I've said, is the relevance of historical writings for geostrategy. So essentially, what do we do with the past and how do we uh, view the past um, when we are planning for the present and the future? In this context, I'd like to uh, talk about two scholars. The first one is um, uh, Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen, as you know, is a Nobel laureate, is an economist. Um, and in his book, Argumentative Indian, he wrote that history is important for the lessons that we can draw from history. 
um, and the lessons that he talks about and that he um, uh, he mentions in his book, uh, where he talks about um, rationality of Indian tradition, uh, the uh, diversity and the liberal thought of India. So he quotes Ashok, uh, the Mauryan emperor Ashok of third century BCE, and of course, um, uh, Buddha as the embodiments of this rational and critical tradition. So that is one aspect uh, in which the past has been viewed um, in, uh, by, um, by an economist, I would argue, uh, when uh, talking about the present. Now this, uh, most historians would not agree with this, and I'm really pleased to uh, share my thoughts that uh, Professor Sabesachi Bhattacharya, uh, who, was, um, uh, who was also at the Center for Historical Studies, JNU, uh, he reviewed Amartya Sen's book, and he argues that this notion of continuity between the past and the present, uh, one needs to challenge that. It doesn't really exist. And instead, he says, uh, what we see between the past and the present is a dialogic link. And um, this uh, dialogue or this dialogic link between the past and the present is both desirable um, and should be undertaken. So it is this dialogue between the past and the present uh, and uh, Panikar's role in this dialogue that I want to stress in my presentation. So essentially what I'm trying to do uh, is uh, talk about Panikar's studies, but also place them in context and to say that uh, Panikar, in, in a certain sense, was also uh, a person of his times, but what we have made in the post-independence period of his writings is quite another issue. And so really, we need to think about, uh, uh, think about the post-independence period more critically, as, uh, as I would suggest towards the end. Why did Panikar suddenly think of the sea? I mean, he was the first maritime historian. Did it have anything to do with, with his birthplace? Uh, he was, uh, he was um, uh, born in the princely state of Travancore. The princely state of Travancore, the dates are 1729 to 1947. 1947, at Indian independence, um, it merged with, uh, with the uh, new nation state of India. Panikar was born in a place called Kavalam. And in his autobiography, he writes, and I found this really fascinating, he writes that the dominant feature at Kavalam was water and not land. And he gave, goes into great detail of the boats that were used for transportation and the ways in which he traveled um, in Travancore right up to the time that he went to Oxford for his uh, future studies. So uh, he brings alive in his autobiography this, uh, this landscape, this maritime landscape of uh, Kavalam, uh, which no doubt um, uh, did seem to influence the way in which uh, he progressed and in which the, uh, in the ways in which his studies progressed. He was a, he was a scholar at uh, Oxford, at, uh, Church College, uh, at Christ Church College, Oxford, and he studied history and anthropology. Um, what, is, uh, what is significant, and I will, I will talk about this more in my next slide as well, that he was a member of the Oxford Majlis. And it is as a member of the Oxford much list that he wrote his first um, uh, for first paper, uh, which was Problems of uh, Greater India. And that paper won him an award. It's also interesting that when he was returning uh, by passenger ship, and this was during the time of the war, uh, the ship was, uh, uh, was hit by a German torpedo. I'm not sure. He doesn't say very much in his uh, autobiography about how he felt about, um, about this, um, the German hitting. Uh, the German torpedo, but he was very thankful that he survived and he went on uh, to his studies and his work. So he, um, briefly then, for, uh, for about three years, he taught at uh, what was then Aligarh College and subsequently became Aligarh Muslim University. But by 1922, he quit academics. And um, I agree with him when he says, um, I mean, though, even though I survived in academics much longer, it was the tameness of academic life that bored me. So um, even though he has gone on to write the books, um, to, uh, to contribute to, ac to academics, academic life by itself was not something that held much fascination for him. And um, where he then shifted was one, journalism. So he was the founder editor of the Hindustan Times, the, a newspaper which continues uh, to the present. 
Um, and uh, of course, he returned to England in 25 for one year. But uh, then he shifted to politics. But before I go to that, I just want to highlight the importance of the Oxford Majlis, which was a debating society in Oxford. This debating society was open only to Indian students. So it was really something, uh, and Indian by Indian, I mean South Asian, because it had uh, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, and, Sri and uh, people from Sri Lanka. Of course, none of these nation states existed in 1896. Um, the, uh, the demands or of the students as they debated and discussed on Sunday nights um, at Majlis meetings was complete independence for India. And hence, it is, um, it is no surprise uh, that the Majlis was considered a den of treason by the India office. And what you see on the screen is really a quote from his autobiography where he discusses the meetings of the Majlis, which, uh, which provide you an indication of his political thought as he was at Oxford and moved towards politics. And many of the speakers who spoke at this Majlis, that's, this is also important, were major uh, speakers from India, uh, pe uh, people who were part of the freedom struggle, uh, Lala Lajpat Rai, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Rabindranath Tagore, Sarojini Naidu, Mohammad Ali Jinnah, and so on and so forth. So even while he was studying at Oxford, his interest in politics had already taken root. Um, I'd like to bring in this idea because uh, the idea of India is something which is very fashionable these days. You read it in the newspapers all the time and everybody writes about the idea of India. So I do want to put this on the table that Panikkar had an idea of India uh, during his Oxford days, which he wrote about and which he also, uh, uh, which he also proposed at these Oxford Majlis meetings. And this was, uh, the first point he made was that uh, this notion that Indian unity was exclusively a product of British conquest, he did not agree with this. So clearly um, the, the current dominant historical thinking that uh, India as a unity was only after British conquest is something um, which was uh, not acceptable to Panikkar. Um, what was his nationalism? And he's written a whole book on that, but uh, his nationalism, um, essentially um, valued diversity, local experiences, um, and coexistence of several languages and religions. And this, uh, I think, is very, very important because, as you know, uh, many of the writers of the pre-independence period are today referred to as nationalists by historians who wrote in the post-independence period. He was also critical and agree, again, I agree with this, uh, that um, um, there was a lack of interest that the Congress and the national movement had for the South. And this is something that you see in all his writings. Um, and he keeps stressing that um, one needs to think about uh, peninsular India. By South India, I'm not referring only to Tamil Nadu. I'm talking about the peninsula, whether it's Maharashtra, Andhra, Karnataka, Kerala, uh, or Tamil Nadu, that one needs, to, one needs to really focus on the sea as it influenced um, the history of peninsular India and much of Indian history is very much uh, North focused and Delhi based. By the 1928, he had shifted to politics. He first served um, in many princely states. Um, he was the advisor to the Maharaja of Kashmir, to the Maharaja of Patiala, and the, the, he was a Diwan of Bikaner. So um, he, uh, he was uh, well equipped between 28 and 47 um, to learn and to experience firsthand uh, the issues relating to Indian independence, which is um, what the princely states fought. Uh, and this also brought him into close contact with many of the leaders uh, of the national movement, um, Gandhi, Nehru, uh, uh, and he was a sort of go between um, the Congress at that time uh, between Nehru and Gandhi and many of the rulers of the princely states. So this experience of the uh, the uh, princely states um, their thinking uh, was something which is which was to play a very valuable and a critical role uh, when he subsequently became um, a member of the reorganization committee of independent india uh, post 47 he was um, uh, appointed um, uh, the ambassador uh, first to uh, china and he served in china both under communist and uh, under pre-communist and communist regimes, and then Egypt and uh, France. 
And here you see him in a 1952 picture with uh, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit and with the Chinese uh, Prime Minister Chow Wen Lai. Uh, many of, um, at, it is at this time that Panikkar wrote both in Malayalam, he was a prolific writer also in Malayalam. Uh, um, some of this is translated, not all of it. Um, he wrote poetry, he wrote um, uh, history, uh, he, uh, and in general, he was um, he was well versed in Sanskrit. Um, so he had a very wide uh, canvas and a very uh, and a very wide reach. Uh, something that I'd like to point out here is that some of his books, such as for example on Gulab Singh of Kashmir or Malabar and the Dutch, uh, these are books which he researched based on primary sources. Gulab Singh, of course, he was uh, he uh, was based in the princely state of Punjab. Uh, but um, in his autobiography, he writes about uh, looking at the archives um, in Europe uh, for the uh, for the Portuguese and the Dutch um, when he wrote his um, his history of uh, the um, of um, uh, of the Dutch in Malabar um, uh, and um, published his book. So um, clearly, much of his writing or many of his books were based on his personal experience also on his study of the primary material. He also wrote Indian nationalism, its origin, history, and ideals. And I think it's important to reread um, his book on Indian nationalism. Let me shift to the main focus of my talk, which is India and the Indian Ocean, as the DG mentioned. Um, this was something which he produced in 1945. Um, in, uh, um, in his writings, in his autobiography, he mentions um, that he wrote this book to counter the argument of Guy Wint, who was who taught at Oxford and he was considered an authority uh, on the uh, politics of Asia. And clearly, Panikkar did not agree with him and wrote his own book. Um, um, now, one of the one of the points that I'd like to highlight is that unlike his other books, which I've just mentioned, this was based on secondary writings. So Panikkar did not do primary research for this book. And I think it's important to understand that if we are contextualizing the studies of Panikkar and if we are trying to understand why he wrote what he wrote. The book, of course, got enormous response. And you see the, you see the quotation at the bottom, uh, again from his autobiography, where he says, in England, the book stirred up a storm of argument. In India, all the leading uh, newspapers devoted articles to it um, and uh, he goes on to say that the book went into uh, three um, uh, three editions in England and um, is now a textbook for naval students. So I quite enjoyed the way um, he uh, talked about his book um, and the way he wrote that this clearly had a major impact. Now some of the uh, some of the quotes, and I've just picked up a few of them. Um, DG has already mentioned, Dr. Agman has already mentioned uh, the first one, which is India never lost her independence till she lost the command of the sea in the first decade of the 16th century. And this is something which one reads again and again uh, in many writings uh, which um, refer to uh, Panikkar. Uh, but there are three others which I would like to highlight, which to my mind, and I may be wrong, um, um, are not mentioned, are not discussed as frequently um, as the first one. Uh, uh, one, of course, is that India, independent India required investment in mercantile shipping. And he makes a strong case for this in his book, India and the Indian Ocean. Uh, and I don't see much of that um, written about, but I may be wrong, and I would be, um, I would, uh, be delighted if somebody did provide me uh, references for this. Uh, the second point is um, he also talks about, and I'd like to quote here, uh, a truly impregnable oceanic policy for India is possible only in the closest collaboration and association with the states of the Indian Ocean area. I don't see this happening in terms of academics, in terms of maritime history. Um, well, to a certain point written about to an extent, but again, I would argue that this is something which we have not paid too much attention to. And finally, of course, is, his, uh, is the point he uh, wrote about uh, that he was concerned because of an un-Indian wave of pacifism. I stress un-Indian and I stress wave of pacifism. 
And he talks about Gandhi and Nehru and their love for Buddhism and their love for Ahimsa. And um, I've written about this elsewhere. And this is something which is very clear um, when uh, we look at our national symbols and when we look at our post-independence history. But that's not something which concerns me here. Let me move on to, um, uh, again, to talk about um, uh, India and the Indian Ocean. Uh, you, on the screen, I've just put together the contents uh, of, the, of the book. And as you can see, it, uh, it is quite extensive uh, from what he calls the Hindu period, which is really uh, the, from the ninth century and the period of Chola invasion. And he goes on to the, um, uh, to the British and after the Second World War. So, you know, just um, at the time of Indian independence. Now, um, he makes a distinction between the Western Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal. Western Indian Ocean, he argues, uh, the movements were largely related to trade. Um, and uh, he says um, this was carried on by the Arabs. Uh, it is in the um, across the Bay of Bengal that he uh, gives emphasis to the Cholas, the imperial Cholas, 9th to 13th century, and he talks about Chola invasion. Uh, and what he, what in his chapter, the Hindu period, he uh, goes on and stresses that it was this Chola invasion which led to Hindu colonization, as he terms uh, the period. Um, I have uh, lots of issues with this, and I've written about this, so this is not the first time. And um, I do think that we need to consider uh, many angles when we are discussing K.M. Panikkar, and including where we have moved from what was written about in uh, 45, when the book was written, and as we discuss it in 21, 2021. So um, the, um, if you look at this map, what you see is that blue line, which talks about trade routes. And again, there has been a lot of work of um, merchant guilds, of Tamil uh, medieval merchant guilds, Manigramam, Ayavole, and so on, trading all the way up to China. Uh, we do not have, that does not figure in our dominant public discourse, even though the Chola invasion figures again and again. Second point, um, when we look at the dynasty, the, the map shows in blue uh, Chola territory. But then it has a much larger area, which is referred to as um, what, I would, what I would sort of define as Chola period influence. And this influence um, uh, is in the form of architecture, temples, images, um, um, ritual traditions, use of language, so on and so forth. So the influence is much more broad-based, much more cultural. Uh, and much more widespread than what the Chola invasion theory uh, uh, led us to believe. Um, and I agree that much of this is post-independence, and so it would not be fair uh, to fault Panikar for not including this. Um, something, again, which I would like to point out is that uh, there's very little discussion on Buddhism. And this, by, by and large, was, um, uh, was the trend in the pre-independence period, even though India's um, um, networks and connections with Southeast Asia um, also drew on Buddhism and India's uh, Buddhist heritage. So who then were um, Panikkar's contemporary writers and whom do, does he refer to in his book? I had mentioned that um, uh, his book draws on secondary sources. For the Chola invasion, he draws to a large extent on Nilkan Shastri, uh, who wrote um, 1935, The Cholas, and this book um, has continued till today to be um, a sort of major reading uh, for people who do South Indian history. Uh, and really, there was there's a lot of Nilkan Shastri in Panikkar's uh, writing. Uh, the two other people whom he refers to, but uh, perhaps um, does not draw them into the debate and discussion, one is Radha Kumud Mukherjee, who wrote Indian Shipping, uh, Radha Kumud Mukherjee, uh, of course, he writes about Bengal, um, the rivers of uh, uh, Ganga, and uh, uh, the importance of the rivers of Bengal in shipping and merchant activity. Uh, and he wrote this book in 1912. Uh, the, the third person uh, whom Panika refers to, but again, very briefly, is uh, James Hornell. He was an expert in fishing traditions. Uh, he uh, uh, wrote several books, including Water Transport, where he discusses and describes the present boat building traditions, or at that time, um, at the time of independence, boat building traditions of India. That's in 1946, the book was published. So it is these three uh, that he uh, talks about. 
But let us move on. What was the situation in the 1940s and what prompted um, Panikkar to write his books and to draw on uh, history um, to, to suggest that maritime uh, connections were very significant and important? And um, um, very briefly, again, um, in just two or three slides, I would like to highlight um, the, uh, the um, characteristics of the 19th century. Uh, from 1825 to 1873, Singapore was a penal settlement, and um, there were uh, uh, almost about 15 to 20,000 convicts who were sent um, from the colonies um, to Singapore. But by 1873, many of these um, uh, many of these started, particularly the Indians, started small businesses and became entrepreneurs. Um, early 19th century um, um, was also important because the British, uh, by this time, the East India Company and then the British Raj, used Indians, particularly Indian sepoys and uh, the Bengal Native Infantry, to police many of the centers, many of the settlements in Southeast Asia. And that to my mind, has had a very different uh, and, a, and quite a negative uh, impact, which one doesn't read too much about in the literature. And of course, again, Sunil Amrit has written a great deal about 1940s and uh, how the 1940s led to um, mass uh, migrations. And uh, he says that approximately 28 million people emigrated from India, and most of them went to Burma, Ceylon, and Malaya. So um, uh, there's been a lot of work on the 1940s and uh, the kinds of movements that took place. The, uh, the visual imagery of the, 19, of, the, of the 19th century and the early 20th century that remains are the, um, the, the sepoys, the six sepoys, who were members of the Singapore police force and also the chetiars or the moneylenders uh, who were important in, uh, in Singapore. I'd also like to mention two other transnational networks. The reason being there's still not much work on them, and I think that these two networks are important, uh, but need to be followed up in greater detail. One is the network which was established by the Theosophical Society. The Theosophical Society was essentially set up in 1875 in New York, in America. Uh, it was set up by, um, by Blavatsky, by Madame Blavatsky, and also by Henry Alcott. And um, then it spread all the way uh, to Southeast Asia, to Japan, um, and was a major player, I would argue, um, in the revival of Buddhism. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in the revival of Buddhism and also in the acceptance of Buddhism uh, by uh, Indian leaders. And that, I think, requires uh, more data, more uh, research. The second uh, transnational network was an, the Revolutionary Movement Network. And there are many of them. I only talk, refer to very briefly here, the one that was set up by Subhash Bose and the Indian National Army. And again, this, this a lot, there's some work that has been done on this. Um, and uh, people have worked and researched the Indian National Army. But it needs to be brought into the public discourse and how these um, these na transnational networks shaped or changed the course of our national movement. In his autobiography, Panikkar writes that he wrote um, his books, uh, Future of Southeast Asia and India in the Indian Ocean, to indicate his awareness of India's, national, uh, India's international responsibilities. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but just about very briefly about the two transnational networks. Theosophical Society, I said in 1871, uh, 1875, it was set up in New York. By 1883, it had established itself in India, first in Calcutta, Madras, um, um, Sri Lanka. And uh, uh, then it had offices all the way um, uh, Indonesian archipelago, Japan, Singapore. And Anagarik Dharmapal, who was um, uh, a prominent uh, Sri Lankan, um, he uh, was a very influential and was at the forefront uh, for the revival of Buddhism um, uh, in Sri Lanka, more importantly in India, and he also traveled uh, a great deal. Uh, my apologies. Um, he also traveled a great deal um, in uh, um, uh, across the world, both to America and also to Southeast Asia. 
um, just um, two views of uh, monuments set up by the Indian National Army. The first one is from Singapore, uh, which was set up in uh, 45, um, but it was demolished by Mountbatten. And when the British um, recaptured Singapore, um, and it is now, uh, it was re-erected in 95 by the National Heritage Board. And the other one, of course, is was set up by the Japanese and is in Imphal. Um, another, uh, another aspect of the 1940s we need to consider is the Second World War and the Japanese conquest of Southeast Asia uh, and the fact that uh, after the Japanese uh, conquest, the pattern of migration reversed with large number of Indians returning home. And um, these, uh, this was also because of the local national movements that came up both in Burma, Malaya, many other, uh, many other countries of Southeast Asia, uh, which then led to a reversal of the migration and reversal of the movements, um, uh, particularly of Indians, as there were large anti-Indian feelings in parts of Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, the question that I would like to raise after discussing very briefly these two transnational networks is, which of them was adopted by independent India? And um, no guesses for the answer. Uh, of course, it was Buddhism. And um, I would like to deliberately quote Arun, uh, Admiral Arun Prakash. He was a former chief of naval staff. He wrote in 2018, uh, no one paid attention to Panikkar because just weeks before independence, India was busy with 1947 Asian Relations Conference, which was held in Delhi uh, in Puranakila, where Jawaharlal Nehru articulated his grand vision of India's role in, in emerging Asia, an idealistic dream in which a nonviolent India would be an exemplar by eschewing the use of force. Now, something which I haven't understood. Um, and again, um, this remains a mystery to me, and I do not have any answers. Given the fact that Panikkar was so influential um, in Congress circles, he was close to Nehru and close to Gandhi. Given the fact that uh, Nehru, as you know, was an avid reader, uh, he had read books by Panikkar, and Panikkar writes about this in his autobiography. So it's not that I'm making this up. Um, so clearly, Jawaharlal Nehru was very well aware of um, what um, K.M. Panikkar wrote and what uh, he was uh, suggesting. Um, and the third point is uh, that no doubt Panikkar himself was in a very powerful and influential position, being very close um, uh, to, the, uh, to the new uh, government um, uh, of India in the post-independence period. So having said all of that, it is, it is not clear to me why Panikkar's maritime vision was dropped. But I certainly think that uh, it was dropped. Not, it's not for me to talk about um, international relations and politics. That's not my subject. I'm talking about history. And I would argue that the legacy of uh, um, Panikkar as maritime historian has not been given the attention that it deserved. And there was very little writing on maritime history in India. Um, um, the, the people who wrote under the Greater India Society, they were termed nationalists uh, by historians, by our uh, historians who wrote in the post-independence period in India. And um, as a result, and this is, uh, I think, a disaster that was that happened, that um, India's expertise on Southeast Asia, uh, it was over and done with. And uh, there was very little studies very little interest in Southeast Asia that continued in the post-independence period. And um, the, whole, uh, the whole theory of Chola invasion, I find, it continues to be repeated. Uh, but unfortunately, as it happens with a lot of um, what we repeat again and again without understanding, is that um, there is, uh, there's very little research that has been done on this. Um, very little uh, interest in doing that research uh, or in finding out more about either shipping or about the way this was organized. None of that um, interests us, but yet we read and we regurgitate uh, issues of which we feel uh, are important to us. And this is where I think that the past and the present and history has a bearing 
or historians have a, have a responsibility, I would say, uh, to the present. So uh, the, uh, I quote from Panikar, uh, it is time to challenge this distortion of Indian history, which continues to be written, uh, not from the point of view of India as a whole, but from the point of view of Delhi and its changing dynasties. And um, uh, I would like to close um, with um, Dg's, um, um his uh, paper that he wrote, uh, and he's been writing a great deal, and I really enjoyed reading his his um, papers in the newspapers um, on the Greater India Society, on Panikar, on maritime consciousness, um, uh, and uh, particularly important at this point as we discuss um, uh, Panikar's legacy is the uh, quotation that um, there is, however, a core to the Greater India Project which retains relevance for us today. And that is of historians and scholars working against great odds to write histories of places and times far removed from their own. If we can recreate just that scholarly impulse, the legacy of a greater India will remain with us. And like the DG, I continue to hope and I continue to, um, to pray that some of our younger generation, uh, some of us would get uh, we may be able to um, encourage or find people who would get interested in the history of Southeast Asia, in India's maritime connections, uh, and do some um, good, uh, rigorous research. With that, thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to share my thoughts, um, and uh, I'm grateful for being invited uh, to this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ray. That was a, a wonderful talk, and I'm sure there will be many, many questions um, at the end of the panel. I now introduce our uh, second speaker, um, uh, Dr. Patrick Bratton, who is an Associate Professor of National Security Strategy, as well as the Admiral William Halsey Chair of Naval Studies at the United States Army War College. Uh, prior to that, he served as Associate Professor and Acting Department Chair of Social Sciences at uh, Hawaii Pacific University in Honolulu. Uh, Dr. Breton specializes in foreign policy analysis with a focus on maritime security strategy. He's written extensively on strategic issues in the Indian Ocean and Asia Pacific region, including a number of papers in regard to India and India's uh, maritime strategy and posture. And today, Dr. Breton will speak to us about Panika, geography, and sea power. Welcome, Dr. Breton. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here, and I was quite excited when I saw this conference being organized last year. Um, just a, a, word, a couple of quick disclaimers I have to make. One, um, these are my views, not the views of the Army War College or the Department of Defense or the United States government. And then perhaps more importantly, another disclaimer, um, it's quite late where I'm at. So if my presentation or my response to questions is not at my best, I will blame it uh, on it being 1.30 in the morning where I am. But I'm happy to be here nonetheless. Um, so I wanted to, I'm going to start sharing my screen and I wanted to talk about my project that I've been working on the past couple of years about Penneker and where I hope it might bring something of interest uh, to the panel uh, and, to the, um, and to this conference. One second, I will start sharing my screen. Uh, do you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So I got interested in, in Panikar a few years ago um, when um, I was uh, doing work and constructing curriculum that we have where I work uh, on sort of maritime issues, sea power. And I was interested in looking at different perspectives, sort of non-Western uh, perspectives on sea power and strategy. And I went back and looked at Panikar's book on the Indian Ocean, and it got me quite intrigued about what an interesting historical figure he was, as mentioned earlier, not just as a historian or geostrategist, but also as a person who played an important role in policy um, as an ambassador in China, Egypt, and France, uh, United Nations, and other things. And so this has started me on a, a, 
a project um, looking at Panikker's both thinking and also his life experiences. So this first part that I'm going to just sort of share with you as part of my presentation is sort of the first part of my wider research where I'm looking at sort of the intellectual sources of Panikker's thinking, and I'm trying to do an in-depth study of his key works. And so right now my talk here will focus mostly on his early works, uh, his early works as being historian in the 20s and the 1930s. And then this really key moment uh, in his intellectual history in the 1940s where he became not just a, a national figure writing about India and security, but an international figure uh, writing many different articles, including, of course, India Quarterly, uh, as, as you well know, and many other articles, both in India and then going back to um, Britain and the, and the empire. And I wanted to share some of the findings about what I was thinking were important for Panikkar in terms of geography, history, sovereignty. And I think three things, and these have already been touched on uh, as well. So I'd like to try and hopefully build on some of these issues. The key aspect of the relationship between sovereignty and sea power, how to organize defense of India and the Indian Ocean in an era of geopolitical and technological change. And then this, this interesting aspect of sort of a cooperative vision for sea power and maritime security, which is mentioned earlier, I think is often left out in contemporary discourses of Panikkar. Just as an aside, my, my research is also focused on his later diplomatic career. And I've had Decent luck in the past couple of years, both at the National Archives and at the Nehru Library, um, looking at diplomatic cables and reports he wrote for Nehru. So that's also something I can speak a bit with as well that's not entirely related to, to what I'm talking about today in the q &A. Um, As mentioned earlier, he, he comes from a different perspective, again, coming from the South uh, of India and having in the, the great quote that was mentioned earlier about having water being the dominant element in his life rather than the land, I think is quite telling. And I think that's something that's very telling in his autobiography and his histories about this connection that he felt that South India had with the wider Indian Ocean and having a different historical narrative in the North. And this is reflected in his later books about geographical history of India and things in the 1950s. But again, his kind of conception of having an Indian history as a dialectic between the sort of dominant land-based history of the Gangetic Plain with sort of this maritime history that exists in the South. And again, this, this, great, this great antidote of when he was studying in Oxford and his, uh, boat, and his boat got uh, torpedoed <laughs> and right in the ending months of the war. And again, being one of the only survivors out of, uh, uh, of, the, of that, I think probably also left a mark on him in terms of appreciation of maritime power. So I wanted to kind of get more into his ideas here. And so, again, as I mentioned, sovereignty, thinking about naval strategy in an era of change, and again, this cooperative vision. So, again, the, the key thing here is how sea power is linked to sovereignty. And again, linking back the end of sort of the loss of sovereignty in India and Asia, not to, say, the British and Plessy and so on, but earlier when the Portuguese entered the Indian Ocean uh, in the early part of the 16th century. And again, this is uh, as he later sort of defines it in his Asian Western dominance about the Vasco da Gama epoch of Asian history, this domination of maritime power over land power in Asia, which is linked to the end of sovereignty. And, and this is something that goes through a lot of his work, and it's flushed out pretty early uh, in the 1920s and, of course, elaborated when he talks about the Portuguese in the Malabar. One slide off and use, I, I'm, I'm used to teaching army officers who don't think too much about the ocean, so I tend to have a lot of visuals. And so when thinking about why sea power is so important for sort of this history of losing sovereignty, I often give a lot of maps that show the history of, we, of Western or even Japanese colonialism in Asia. Talk about how important the sea is in terms of getting access. So if we think about a large land power like China, this kind of a map is great because it shows you how close a lot of these cities based on rivers are actually to the coastline and how different colonial powers were able to utilize that and leverage that. So if you look at just histories of, uh, it doesn't have to be India, it can be China, again, different routes in the Second Opium War or in the coalition relief to the Boxer Rebellion and things like that, going over the same territory uh, in terms of violating Chinese sovereignty during this time period. And again, this is something, if you're thinking about contemporary, if you're thinking about Chinese looking out into the Western Pacific, what is this, how do these different island chains, how are they conceptualized as well? And again, this is something that it's not necessarily that the past is the same as it is today, but these narratives, these dialogues, these, these ideas get picked up, uh, get repackaged and reused for today. It's you know impossible to find an article talking about Chinese strategy that doesn't quote Sun Tzu. So again, we can think about people picking up Panikkar's ideas and things and the maritime discourse today. 
So what are sort of these elements of, of Portuguese strategy that were important? And this is kind of a simplification of, of Panacurst's ideas. But again, thinking about why the Portuguese were able to leverage the geography of the Indian Ocean, which he calls more like a closed sea, more like a large Mediterranean than an open sea like the Atlantic or the Pacific. And again, key aspects of choke points, so having a base on the Indian mainland, and then having basically the doors to open and close access points on the east and the west. And this sort of sets up a model. So for Penneker, it's really the Portuguese who established this, and the, the British merely establish a different version, a sort of Albuquerque 2.0, with basis at strategic points and the secure bases on the Indian subcontinent. And so this sort of sets this paradigm for sort of Western dominance within Asia. The crisis point, and this is something that's quite interesting, is when you get to World War II. Uh, and so you get this period of crisis and sort of British imperial thinking about how to defend India, right? So the traditional way you can think about Curzon and the frontiers, and everything is very land-based, right? The threat is a land power, Imperial Russia, the Great Game, and all that, and this need for buffer states. And this feeling, for applicably from Panikur's perspective, that sea power was overlooked. It was assumed that the Royal Navy controlled the Indian Ocean, so there wasn't really a need to think about that. The enemy was always over a buffer state, over a mountain, and so on and so forth. So, again, with 1941-42, with the fall of Singapore and the Japanese Indian Ocean rage, this seemed to, to, to call into question this previous beliefs about imperial, imperial defense and having the idea that the threat was pri primarily land-based. So this spawns up this Viceroy Study Group under Sir Olaf Groh, thinking about how geopolitics and technology have changed, that India is no longer secure, the principal threats are not land-based, and the control of strategic locations to defend India at a much greater distance than being thinking about buffer states, and perhaps a lot of physical geography, uh, in terms of narrow seas, in terms of mountain passes and things like that, are less important in an era of air power and other technological developments. So it's, it's interesting here, um, you see this sort of indirect link um, between Panikur and between a lot of these ideas going out with the study group and other ideas of sort of imperial defense during this time period. Supposedly, Caro was really interested in bringing uh, Indian uh, nationals into the study group, but was rebuffed uh, by the by the other uh, parts of the colonial government, because he felt it was interesting, it would be vital to sort of develop a sort of an Indian elite that was a sort of, how should we say, thought similarly along the lines of British administrators. So you have sort of a parallel development that you could say it's an intellectual zeitgeist of the time period where you see different people, whether it's Panikur, whether it's Guy Wint, whether it's General Tukar, talking about similar issues about the challenges of geography and technology. And it seems that Caro and Guy Wint also worked behind the scenes as sort of informal patrons to, to Panikur to get his early work past British censors during the wartime and to get his ideas out there, and that serves the purposes to, of this, uh, according to Corot, of the Viceroy Study Group. Uh, moreover, you also see Panikur getting into a whole series of international conferences. So there's the Institute for Pacific Relations Co Conference in 1942 in Quebec, and he presented a paper which supposedly led to his request of writing a book which came out to be the future of Southeast Asia. And Panikur sort of saw the future of Southeast Asia being sort of perhaps the first part, and then you see the second part coming in with the India and the Indian Ocean. And he published several articles during this time period from 1944 to about 1948, all on variations of the themes that I'll be talking about uh, today. And he also got involved in many other things, the Con Commonwealth Conference and other things. So this is really the shift from Panikur being a historian, a journalist, uh, advisor of the princely states and, and so on into being this sort of international sort of international intellectual and sort of perhaps sort of a go-to person if you will if you were looking for an Indian perspective on international security international organization in the region it's really kind of an interesting moment in his intellectual uh, career and again one of the things that he, he kind of stresses in all these books is the key of sea power to Asian independence and again many of the famous quotes we truly said that India never lost independence until she lost command of the sea the first decade of the 16th century um so what are some of these changes uh and things that are going on and what is what is where does Panikar see sort of 
maritime security and geopolitics moving in the 1940s. So he sees a lot of changing strategic geography. So changes the technology, which we'll talk about, you know, in a little bit, but also sort of the end of the imperial system. So he sees, you know, he's part of the nationalist movement, as I said earlier. He's traveled around. He's seen that there are other aspects in Asia where nationalism is moving. Post-war, post-war Asia is going to look very different uh, than pre-war Asia. And he very early on feels that China, although it is, you know, in, in suffering from civil war, Japanese invasion, and so on, he feels after the war, China, again, will be a large power. So he kind of proposes in his earlier work how to answer two questions. How to ensure a durable peace in Asia post-war, and how to ensure freedom for various peoples within Asia. And so this is one of the ways I kind of answer this, is we often talk uh, uh, where I work about the various sort of all great thinkers seem to have sort of trinities, right? So whether it's Clausewitz or any of these other people. And so I often joke the Mahan sort of has a trident rather than a trinity. And so perhaps Panikar also as well can have a trident. So kind of three pegs, to, as I sort of see, three pillars to this naval strategy, sort of a security uh, community, and a, and a kind of interesting syncretic liberalism, uh, I would call it for lack of a better term. So in terms of post-war naval strategy, so Panikar makes some very bold statements in the India and the Indian Ocean book and a few of the other ones about problems of India defense and things. Uh, he says that it's to win command of the sea in a decisive naval engagement like Trafalgar or something like that is no longer possible. And to control the whole sea uh, the way that the British seemed to want to do through imperial defense in the 19th century was no longer workable given technological changes. So he said sort of, he was thinking, the technology made island and littoral areas easier to secure, and this gave the ability for small navies and littoral areas to basically deny access of larger navies. Um, so again, power projection the way that the British had traditionally done, he viewed to be much more difficult. Um, so the lesson for him would be a small regional navy, like an independent India would have, could be secure in the Indian Ocean region with what we would call today a sort of anti-access strategy, particularly when backed by a larger power. And this varied depending in his writings about either the UK or the US, and I'll talk more about that later. And here's sort of his quote about that, no reason why small, efficient, well-balanced Navy should not be able to secure India's interests within the Indian Ocean. This gets into the security community, which links in some ways to the sort of the, the concerns of the sort of imperial defense of the Viceroy study group. So one of the, the issues here that Panikar is, uh, is also wrestling with is once you foresee an Asia with many different independent states where these key strategic areas that control the Indian Ocean are no longer integrated with India and a British empire, how do you secure India of, say, Singapore as its own independent country or aid in its, is its own independent country? How do you secure the, how do you secure India? And so also as well, he felt a lot of these smaller Asian states would be unable to defend themselves and the geography of Southeast Asia would be too attractive. And so large extra regional powers would again be coming in. So again, they would be subject to this influence. So he, various ideas are floated in here. So sometimes this is a robust commonwealth kind of idea. He also talks in, in one article about forming an Indian Ocean Regional Council. Uh, and he often wanted to center this on what he felt were the two large states of the region, India and Indonesia, supporting the smaller states and also creating an international space for China. And again, he felt China would reemerge and you needed to provide China with a space for China to be a great power back again with Asia. Also though, this community would have some backing from an extra regional power, Britain and or the United States. And this gets, leads into this other questions uh, that, that peer up earlier on in his writings that kind of fall out a little bit toward the, the mid to the late 1940s. Um, no regional security he felt was possible unless the populations have some sort of representative government. So as long as you have an imperial system uh, with colonial subjects, he felt there's no way this would actually be secured. So again, this kind of dovetails in some of the arguments, uh, the nationalism, you know, having dominion status and so on and so forth. He felt sort of, again, in these earlier writings, perhaps having independent early Asian states who have a sort of similar democratic values tied together with Britain and some sort of, you know, changed uh, more uh, commonwealth uh, where they would actually truly be sort of dominion status. 
Uh, and again, so he would, you could imagine this is kind of a reimagining, if you will, of previous uh, maritime strategies for the region. India is the regional sea power, British and or Commonwealth positions or posts in Aden's and Singapore, and this would create a sort of Indian Ocean Security Community or Council. And so these are these sort of early ideas he was thinking about 43 to 45. Um, Again, you can see some dovetails between Panikar's views and, say, some of Nehru's views about China, uh, in a sense that China was a fellow great Asian civilization. It would have an important role in the war. Uh, and again, you can see some of this later on when Nehru was, uh, sorry, when Panikar was an uh, ambassador, writing back to Nehru. And some of the, the, the ripples he caused there uh, in, were his views were very different than, say, the established diplomatic war in India and, and others. Um, again, just more here quotes. I won't go into all of these about the importance of China and how, again, you're going to have to make role, you're going to have to make a space for China within the post war order. Again, more quotes on China. I won't read all of those to you. And again, when people have now fast forward, right, as mentioned earlier, people look at these, you know, that Penneker was very prophetic that there would be a rise of China as there going to be a new great game or new imperial competition in the Indian Ocean. And I just give you an example of a map that kind of echoes some of these ideas. And again, people are trying to use some of these older ideas in the current discourse about geopolitical uh, competition. And again, language about choke points and so on. Um, if you're thinking as well, if you th the, the, the infrastructure that contemporary China has made in its maritime infrastructure, shipbuilding that was mentioned earlier that Panikar felt was really important for true independence in basing infrastructure, port infrastructure and things. Again, a lot of these writings of Panikar will come more and more to the fore as people look at this investment that China has done. Um, I want to kind of just kind of in closing here, kind of look back. This is a very you know, sort of rough take. This is not anything set in stone or anything necessarily that, that is correct. Uh, but sort of general things that I've thought looking at, at at a lot of his writing. So some of these things seem to, at surface value, have sort of endearing, enduring values and things. So the link between sea power and sovereignty, people, this is something that, again, is a recurring theme uh, that, that comes up in, in much writing. Um, I thought it was very interesting to find him talking about anti-access and aero denial, which has sort of been the buzzword in the Indo-Pacific for the past 10 or more years, the aspect of critical geography. Uh, and again, this, this idea, again, even during World War II, you know, that the U.S. was going to be sort of the new dominant ex-regional power rather than Britain. Some other things perhaps uh, were a little bit more debatable or contestable. Um, we can talk a little bit about how much of this in, in Panikar's writings was, in a sense, sort of reaching his hand out or making a case to a British audience as India was still negotiating its, its, independent, its path to independence. But again, the sort of, particularly early on, an assumption that even with an independent India, Britain would remain uh, very much an Asian power, again, is something that you could be called into question whether or not that was a, a you know an accurate uh, prediction he was making. Uh, the ability of India to work with Pakistan and China cooperatively with inside a sort of Commonwealth framework. It was an interesting idea that I think again people have not talked much about in his writing. And again, kind of an assumption too as well that post independence or post war, the independent path of many Asian states would be similar to to India's path. And so you, you don't get a sense, at least I don't get a sense in many of his writings uh, about, you know, how difficult this might be or how long wars of decolonization might be fought and how this would be wrapped up into essentially Cold War politics and battles of ideologies and things like that. That's also something that's uh, not really there, uh, I would argue, in his wartime writing. So those are some things that, again, things that seem to have been more prescient about what was happening, uh, things that seems to be, I think, ideas that are a little bit more forgotten. So with that, I'm going to just draw to a close, and I will yield the floor, and I'll stop sharing my screen in a second. Thank you very much for this presentation, which was all the more impressive for the, uh, not the late hour, the early hour you have in <laughs> Pennsylvania. Um, with this, I uh, move us onwards to our uh, third and, as it happens, our final um, speaker, since uh, Professor Ilias is not able to join us today. So our final speaker of the morning, morning for some of you, is uh, Dr. Raghul Rajan, who is Assistant Professor of English at Aligarh Muslim University Center in Malapuram in Kerala. 
His expertise lies in the field of literary theory and criticism. He has published numerous articles and research papers in this field and also received a great number of um, awards and honors for his uh, studies and his work. Uh, today, Dr. Rajan will bring his uh, critical literary lens to bear on the versatility of K.M. Panikkar's intellect. The floor is yours, Dr. Rajan. Um, thank you, Dr. Franchi. I hope I'm audible to you. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, thank you. Um, I am very thankful uh, to the whole team of uh, Indian Council of World Affairs and uh, Dr. Prakya Pante, the Director General of ICWA, uh, Dr. T.C. Raghavan, and uh, my fellow, fellow paper presenters in the uh, session, as well as the moderator, Dr. Branche. I thank all of you. I thank uh, the whole ICWA for giving me an opportunity to speak in this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, I'm very uh, delighted to uh, share my thoughts on um, Panika, because uh, there are two connections uh, with Panika, uh, that uh, he is a uh, citizen of my state. Of course, he is Indian and he belongs to Travancore. I'm also a, a, a person who is coming from, who is from Travancore. And uh, secondly, he is a teacher. He was a teacher of the Aligarh Muslim University. He was the first chairman of history department of the Aligarh Muslim University. And I'm also a teacher in Aligarh Muslim University. So my connections, uh, have, I have some personal and location connections with uh, uh, Dr. K. Um, and today I, I, am, um, I would like to share my thoughts on um, where the, the Donald Director General stopped the versatility. My, uh, my paper is uh, actually, it talks on the versatility of uh, Dr. K. M. Panikya. Uh, an English educated man who raised uh, uh, from a very uh, uh, an ordinary village background in Travancore and who's, uh, who educated in the famous Oxford University. And uh, he, uh, he, he, was, he was given posters, many, many administrative and academic posters by the government of India. And he contributed immensely in, in the various fields. Uh, wherever he touched, uh, or which field of work he touched, he made it as golden, I should say. Um, uh, my paper is actually about, I quote, uh, very many lines from uh, Panikar himself. Panikar is a poet, and uh, there is a wonderful line in his poem, The Waves of Thought. The seeds of thought which fall on the mind, watered by continued rain of tears, sprout and in time blossom into many huge flowers. So as he said in his own poetry, his own poem, the seeds of thought which fall on his own mind, it sprouted into very many beautiful flowers. Um, Dr. Pa uh, Kim Baniker, uh, he is a luminary and uh, he's a poet in Malayalam, he's a scholar in English, and he's a professor, editor, advisor to princes and ministers, and he's a diplomat, and uh, he's a historian. And uh, in turn, he is a uh, uh, is a legion, as uh, his Chaku says in his book on King Panikkar. And uh, he's a person uh, who talked uh, globally and uh, worked locally about his countrymen. And uh, he uh, Panikkar wrote about everything uh, around him, no matter it is literature, history, political treatise, culture, or education. Um, perfection, or uh, I should say, uh, comprehensiveness is the hallmark of uh, particles or Oyuva. And uh, he has left a, a, a legacy. I should, I, I may call it as Panikarian legacy for the posterity to emulate and uh, assimilate as well as uh, corroborate. And uh, his five careers, professor, administrator, journalist, uh, author, diplomat, is a man of the world. Kondiyur uh, Narendranath, uh, uh, one of the biographers, one of the best biographers of K.M. Panikkar uh, in the book Sardar Panikkar, His Life and Times, um, catalogs, he in, in a sense catalogs 45 texts in Malayalam and 53 texts in English, including his biography. So um, at this time, uh, anyone can think of a person who has written uh, such uh, uh, works, and they are all standard works also. Uh, uh, we can find very scholarly insights uh, in all the textbooks in Malayalam, 
uh, most of the are literature works as well as the historical uh, and political treatises he has written. So my paper hopes for a journey through the uh, various uh, works and endeavors of um, Paniker and to, as well as to restate, uh, reinstate his stages as one of the uh, uh, stalwarts in uh, our great men of India. And uh, these dimensions, I told you there are very many dimensions of uh, Panikar's versatility or talent, and these dimensions or aspects are intermingled with uh, one another. My first uh, venture is actually as a historian, Professor Heman Shu uh, Prepare already talked about uh, the different debated uh, aspects of, uh, of his personality as a historian. He learned history, practiced historical research, and uh, produced uh, an, uh, notable works. As a historian, his uh, approach is nationalist. Obviously, he is a product of Oxford and uh, where he learned uh, the, the methodology of historiography uh, from Oxford and he's analytical and uh, about him, uh, once uh, Krishna Menon, the, one of the famous defense ministers uh, of India, he said that, there's a famous remark on uh, um, Manika that he can write a history book in half an hour, which I could not write in six years. So that is the uh, 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 noteworthiness of Panikar. And Panikar has a wide canvas. His major historical works are Harsha of Kanauj, uh, the evolution of British policy towards Indian states, Malabar and the Portuguese, India through the ages, Asia and Western dominance, a survey of Indian history, determined credits of Indian history, a history of Kerala, the serpent and crescent, and geographical factors in history. In Indian history. The first historical treatise is actually a, a, a detailed exposition. It was his first book, Sivasha of Kanauj, which he is written when he was a chairman of, when he was a teacher in the Alikar Muslim University, and he situates King Harsha in the great lineage of Indian kings, and um, where he makes a scholarly analysis of uh, Harsha and his uh, contributions even as a literary writer. And the essay points out India as the most civilized country in the 7th century AD. As well as his uh, rudimentary, there are, uh, there are the Indian concept of kingship, uh, which is different from the Western concept of kingship. And he traced that in, in the theoretical work, Origin and Evolution of Kingship in India. And it is based on Nidhi Shastra, the ancient ancient treatise and uh, where he also talks about the concept of council of states for the Indian princely states. Uh, you know, uh, uh, as already all of you know that it was a time when India was under the British rule with very many Indian principal states are there. Then he, uh, as Professor uh, Ray has pointed out, he has wrote three main uh, biographies, the founding of the Kashmir state, the Indian princes uh, uh, in council, and His Highness the Maharaja of Bikaner. These are three major biographies which he wrote when he was the uh, even he was one of the one of the employees of these Indian princes. And he traces the evolution of British policy towards Indian states. Indian states, the government of India, Panika discards the master slave dialectics of British colonial regime towards Indian princely states. What he provides is a critical view of the surety of a uh, uh, British crown and the authority of chamber of princes. And uh, his other works, the working of diarchy in India, the states and constitutional settlement and Indian states, where he offers a critical evaluation of mandate clubs for the reforms. And uh, he is a, uh, as a historian, uh, Panikkar is a historian of the princely states of colonial India. Even today, his works in history will be very helpful to know the, the status as well as the history of princely states of colonial India. And the, what is the uniqueness is that it is an Indian viewpoint uh, rather than uh, the famous uh, uh, the Western viewpoints of Sir William Lee Warner. He wrote uh, enormously on Indian princely states. But we get an Indian viewpoint, the nationalist, Indian nationalist viewpoint of princely states from K. M. Panika. A survey of Indian history and written periods of Indian history, it offers actually a panorama of Indian, Indian history and uh, it, it rectifies the fallacy of a nation's history as a parade of uh, a great men and women. 
It is he, in, 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 I quote his own words, the nation's history is the conscious effort of a people to achieve a civilization, to reach better standards, to live a happier and noble life. And uh, his three determined periods of Indian history are the integration of Indian people from 350 to 250 BC, the resistance to Islam, and the encounter with the West. The Foundations of New India, published in 1963, renders analysis of India's inheritance, social structure, intellectual setting, constitutional tradition, and thinking, the impact of Mahatma and Marx, as well as East West encounter in Indian civilization. Another aspect of uh, uh, Panikkar is Panikkar is a historian of his own state. Kerala, obviously it was also called Malabar at that time, is a historian of Malabar and he traced the, uh, uh, the roots of colonial relation with the princely states, of, uh, princely states of Kerala in his Malabar and the Portuguese. And also there has written a general history of the state called History of Kerala. Malabar is a nostalgia in Panikkar's Oyuba. As I said, he is a native of Kerala. He traced the in ineffectual Portuguese power, the Dutch power in Malabar coast. And uh, the, the later this uh, knowledge also made uh, the uh, uh, great, the, the magnum opus in uh, Panikkar's uh, Oyuba, which is called uh, Asia and uh, Western Dominance. Another important text is Geographical Factors in Indian History, where he construes Indian history as a frequent struggle between the Jantetic Plains and the Deccan area. So uh, this is, these are some kind of uh, uh, new uh, uh, viewpoint. Today it may find as an ordinary viewpoint, no issue, but it was a time in the beginning of India's independence and people, uh, a man like Panikkar is giving a shrewd analysis of Indian history. And in geographical factors in Indian history, it gives due credit to the Himalayans and the Indian Ocean for preserving as well as nourishing the Indian civilization. And uh, he has also uh, emphasized the social, cultural, geopolitical aspects and cherished a nationalistic, I should say, Indian nationalistic as well as Asian perspective in the historiography. And he established the historical naval supremacy of India with historical evidences. And uh, he exhorted the Indian naval skills and competency are far better than and developed than their European counterparts in history. And uh, he upholds that the control of the sea by the Arabian Sea by the Maracas under the Samarin, the Maratha Navy and the Kanoji Angrian Conflict Coast, as well as the, the naval supremacy of the Cholas in Coromandel Coast as the, uh, the examples for the, uh, the advanced naval, uh, uh, naval arena of India in, in, the, in the 15th century AD. And notable historians of South India like K.A. Nilakant Shastri agrees with uh, Panikkar's view on historical supremacy of coastal kingdoms like the Cholas. And uh, as a historian, I would call Panikkar as a jealous faced intellectual who looked back and forth in history ancient, medieval, modern, as well as history of his lifetime is recorded in his historical textus. He wrote on history of India, Indian princely states, national history, and imperial history, apropos India and Western Africa. Dr. Tarashankar Banerjee, and uh, one of the uh, uh, stalwart uh, 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 scholars who studied about Panika is said that Kavala Mathur Panika was not only a great colorful personality, but an event in the realm of historical writing in modern India. He's a passionate historiographer who comprehends Indian history in the light of international affairs and uh, outlook. Uh, I'm just passing to other aspect of Another aspect of uh, um, in Panika was a political theorist. I may quote here Winston Churchill. He remarked that study history, study history, in history lies all the secrets of statecraft. And Panika studied history well and deciphered the mysteries of uh, politics. Obviously, he's not a politician in the current contemporary sense, but I may call him as a true political uh, theorist. He has an inquisitive mind of a journalist and the patience of a historian plumed the theoretician, the political theoretician in Panikkar. He articulated ideas on key political concerns of any nascent state, 
independent from the British crown, like nationalism, federalism, liberalism, and democracy. His vision in political politics is geopolitical, nationalist, and that of a theorist. In internationalism, its origin, history, and ideals, it is one of the earliest treaties of Indian nationalism written upon advice of Baron J. Delegate. Panika wrote about in early years of growth and development of Indian nationalism, and um, you know the, uh, he, from the viewpoint of twenty, uh, he raised meticulously the development of Indian nationalism of his time. But contemporary historians of Indian nationalism, like Partha Chatterjee and Irfan Habib, will disagree with Panika's propositions. Nevertheless, as a pre-independent India's treatise on Indian nationalism by an Indian scholar, the text acquires great relevance. Then another important work of Panikkar is Federal India, which is co-authored by Colonel K. N. Huxer. Panikkar adumbrated the rudimentary precept of Indian federalism. Then since British India was not a unique state, rather two-fifths of its were under the princes and local rulers, Panikkar advanced the idea of India as a federation of states with a Supreme Court. Uh, his contributions. He was also a related to the Constituent Assembly of India, which framed the, 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 so the current Indian constitution. Panikkar presumes democracy as the best governance system for annihilation of casteism in India. To him, democracy can always be victorious in the battle against uh, caste. Then another important, uh, uh, his conviction on the spirit of democracy is true to a liberal intellectual. Then another important work uh, where he talks about democracy is the state and the citizen. It is an analysis of the role of citizen and its importance in nation uh, building. The rumination of Indian political thought later paved the origin of another political treatise called the ideas of sovereignty and state in Indian political thought. The text can be one of the fundamental books on Indian political thought and is a sequel to his earlier origin and evolution of kingship in India. Then another important book is In Defense of Liberalism. It is actually his Saroji Naidu Memorial Lecture at Indian School of International Studies in 1961, and uh, where he dealt with um, liberal doctrines, their growth, eclipse, fulfillment, and uh, uh, by general acceptance of a large areas in Europe, Asia, and America. And he also has shared his apprehensions about newly independent states of Asia and Africa in Afro-Indian sta Asian states and the problems in 1959. He advocated a stable administration, education, and self-sustained economy as the solutions for the growth and development of newly independent states in Asia and Africa of at that time. And Panikkar uh, actually, his aim was an Asian uplift in his political theory. And Saya uh, Zinkin remarks of his three political statements, thesis of Indian Ocean, thesis of research in Asia, in which India would be China's leader uh, uh, um, and interpreter, and now the thesis of London, Delhi axis in contrast to Middle Eastern American axis. In this, uh, uh, these things, only the uh, one of them that the Chinese and the aggression undermines the second thesis and the current international relations is quite different from Panikkar's time. And Panikkar's bias towards the Chinese and the British are often criticized by very many analysts. Critics often attributed the bias to China to his so called communist ideology. Rather than his Asian perspective, the fact of China being the largest Asian country with a historical legacy and its communist regime with utopian ideals made Panikkar keep the band of Asian development to the Chinese. Its belief in the British is the byproduct of his Oxford education and conviction on Anglican modern ideals. Nevertheless, the British had uh, the Britain had many internal issues to handle than her former colonies. Further, the colonies cannot demand a moral obligation and any aid from the British in their welfare after independence. Another uh, uh, blemish or criticism against Panikkar is his Hindu bias. He wrote three important texts on Hindu religion, namely Hinduism and the modern world, Hindu society at crossroads, and Hinduism and the West. Rather than a sectarian bias, the scholarly inquisitiveness of a historian and nationalist made him write these treatises. 
and where he traces that Hindus are neither an organized community nor a sect with central leader or prophet like Christians and Muslims. And he advanced the theory of an organized community as a need of an aware for the welfare of uh, the Hindu community in the second half of 20th century. And uh, he is not a, uh, uh, as people, very many, some people are saying he has some Hindu bias, but he has, is a liberal intellectual. And uh, he once remarked that you cannot follow Manismriti as it is in the modern world. And he also discarded the upright rejection of ancestral knowledge as the axiom of modern outlook. What he actually advocated is you take the best from the, uh, the, uh, the tradition as well as you live, you take the best from the modern and live uh, with a liberal outlook. And uh, the other important Panikya's writing on his caste and religion is a scholarly endeavor rather than any, any, any prejudice. And another important uh, work on his own religion, his own caste is some aspects of my life. It is published in the Journal of Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland, which can be read in tandem with Fawcett's Nyers of Malabar, a very critical uh, uh, historical as well as text in cultural studies about the Naya community in Kerala. So as a political theorist, these are his important contributions. And there is another aspect I'm going to uh, take now is as his contributions in Indian education. And uh, he's, a, uh, he's a visionary in educationist. In, uh, we can say visionary educationist. His career as a, I started his career as a university teacher. And uh, at, the, at, at the time of his death, he was the vice chancellor of the University of Mysore, and he was also the vice chancellor of Jammu and Kashmir University. His essays on education reconstruction in India, published in 1920, unravels his own stand on the prospective Indian education system. Many of his precepts, like the main defect of present system of education, is that its social ideals are entirely different from and to a great extent hostile to Indian conditions. This hostility is often attributed to anglicization of uh, Indian education. Another maxim which he wrote on the essays is that the family is the first school and perhaps the most important one. He supported the education for women and envisioned mother tongue as the best medium for education. It is a 1920 itself. Modern uh, uh, pedagogists are now talking about uh, this uh, theory, but he told that thing in 1920 itself, and the current national education policy of India speaks on this line. You can keep your education in, the, your, in your mother tongue, and thus in educational history and uh, uh, pedagogy, the essays of education reconstruction of, in India by Panika becomes a classic. And the literary figure, um, uh, 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 in Panika, uh, is, you cannot find a Macaulayan clerk serving the empire, but an intellectual who scrupulously studied the affairs around him. Then, uh, as a literary figure, Panika is a notable novelist and poet of Malayalam literature. Malayalam, the native uh, uh, the language of Kerala, and uh, he is a true lover of Malayalam. Even in his autobiography, when uh, one reads his, uh, we can, one can see easily his love for his country, his countrymen, his literature. Kerala Sahith Academy, the, the State Academy of Letters, uh, made him the first president of that, uh, first president. He's a lover of his mother tongue. He wrote eight novels, 20 anthology of poems, five dramas, 14 prose pieces, including his own biography. So fascination for his history, he has wrote historical fiction. And the historic, his historical novels are remarkable in their characterization and historical quality. And in, uh, in poetry, Panikkar preferred Dravidian meters. Dravidian meters over the Sanskrit meters. He is a scholar in Sanskrit also. He has knowledge in Sanskrit, but he wrote in native the, the indigenous Dravidian meters while he is composing poetry. And uh, his essay, Malayalam Poetry and Sanskrit Meters, where he supported the Dravidian meters, it was itself uh, created a revolutionary controversy in the history of Malayalam literature. And his invitation for a, a, a Kathagali performance later paved the way for the famous Kerala Kalamantalam, Kerala's Art of Letters. Uh, in, uh, it, is, it is now world famous uh, academy where a traditional Kerala art forms are taught. Then. Uh, uh, these are the, some, uh, some, uh, some words I view on his contributions in literature. Then as a diplomat, 
As a diplomat, Panikkar's diplomatic life is nourished by his bureaucratic experiences in the states of Bikaner, Kashmir, and Patiala. He has been his adeptness in handling their affairs and representation in the Round Table Conference. It is the that they are one of the major conferences in the history of India, where uh, there is a conference between the in, uh, British and uh, the Indian national leaders. And he may he is called uh, the Leave Warner of India. The diplomat in Panikka was full fledged in post independent India. He was the premier, uh, one of the uh, premier ambassadors to uh, China. And uh, Tarashankar Banaji eulogizes him as the chief architect of friendship between India and the People's Republic of China. Panikka theorized diplomacy in the principles and practices of diplomacy in 1956. It is an amalgamation of his experiential knowledge and wisdom. He trains the principles of diplomacy to Artha Shastra, written by Kautilya, and comprehended Lord Krishna's stand to Pandavas and the envoy to the Kuru court as the secret of diplomacy. Here we can say, as, uh, in the beginning of my paper, I told that uh, uh, there are the various aspects of Panikkar's um, uh, personality or intellect are intermingled. They, they are having some kind of a common platform. So he, his knowledge in traditional Indian uh, 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 Puranas, Indian epics, now he says that Lord Krishna's uh, viewpoint uh, as an ambassador, he, he was an ambassador in the Kuru court, there is an incident in the Mahabharata. It is the best example for diplomacy. I quote with his own uh, words, the primary function of a diplomat is to work for the upholding of the good name of his country, for earning respect of it, and for creating goodwill towards it. So that is the uh, viewpoint of uh, uh, Panika on diplomacy. There's another important work about uh, from his diplomatic experience that is the future of India and Southeast Asia. In Panikkar emphasizes here, the security of Southeast Asia did largely depend on the freedom of nations there. I quote, the political economic freedom for national units, collective responsibility for defense and friendly cooperation between Asia and Europe as the prerequisites for the peace and prosperity of Southeast Asia. And uh, he studied the social cultural history of the countries where he served, particularly uh, 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 in China. He has written a very two important books about China. One is India and China, a study of cultural relations, and in two Chinas, Mum was a diplomat. In two Chinas, he, he speaks on Kumintang China and the subsequent communist China. Panikkar's diplomacy with India is the chief architectural force behind the Panjashil principle of India. Later in the controversial Tibetan issue, Panikkar was deliberately silent due to his high esteem for diplomatic ethics. Many former diplomats of the nation can emulate uh, such standard Panikkar heroes. Asian Western dominance, Malabar history, Indian Ocean studies makes Panikkar a significant scholar of Indian maritime consciousness. His Da Gama Ipo proposition and the discovery of the vitality of Indian Ocean in defense strategy and security concern of India alone prove his intellectual merit. His pamphlet, he has written also a pamphlet, the basis of an Indian Indo-British Treaty. He outlines the need for British aid in initiating the Indian naval power. His contributions on Indian defense history and maritime consciousness are the strategic problems of Indian Ocean in 1944, India and Indian Ocean, an essay on the influence of sea power on Indian history in 1945. He was uh, uh, the Himalayans in Indian life, 1963, and the Himalayas and Indian defense. He traces the vitality of the Himalayas in socio-cultural history and defense arena of India. So Panikkar emphasized uh, the uh, uh, Indian Ocean, importance of Indian Ocean, Indian defense strategy also, as well as he also pointed out the importance of the Himalayas in uh, Indian defense uh, strategy. And uh, uh, he, in Indian Ocean Ring, the IOR theory, current IOR theory, he also the basics, uh, uh, he shall be a focus. He said that many years before, India shall be, uh, one of the focal point of Indian defense shall be Indian Ocean Ring, called IOR. I quote from strategic problems of Indian Ocean, note that the problem of land frontiers is unimportant, but once the command of the sea is lost, India, with her open coastline, will become the easy prey of any predatory power with sufficient strength to block her, her coastal line. And uh, Panikkar's advice for a post-independent India is she shall have, have a clearly defined naval policy with 
both short-term as well as long-term goals. The present ocean policy of comprising Indo-Pacific bears ample testimony to his vision. In his time, the GMU of uh, uh, a maritime space confines to Indian Ocean only. Contemporary historians like uh, and analysts like M. N. Pierce. Pearson, Pius Malekadathil, and Colonel Sridharan acknowledged the contributions of Panikar in Indian maritime history. On the other hand, Panikar's ideas are not palatable to Western thinkers like Guy J. Poker. He called Panikar an opportunist who sails according to the wind. He quotes from Raja Hudson that he will be a communist in Peking, a champion of freedom in Washington, slow, so long as, as it takes, Mr. Panikar somewhere. Similarly, in Sino-Tibetan affair, experts like Claude R.P. criticizes Panikar of his fallacy on Chinese sovereignty over Tibet. However, Panikar writes in his autobiography, I quote, extension on, of communist power to Tibet was a prima facie danger to India. So these kinds of statements itself uh, uh, will, will say uh, uh, Panikar's analysis rather than any kind of prejudice or bias towards the thing. Another aspect that I would like to uh, tell is uh, the last aspect I'm focusing is cultural ambassador. On, he is also a, an ambassador of the culture from where he is. Panikar, in, uh, on Panikar, his sixth counterpart in China, Clement Resoncio, remarks that an Asian first and foremost, just proud of the culture and tradition of his race, he has added in his capacity as a diplomatist to rich contribution. He has already brought as a writer and a historian to diffusion of Indian, of Asian thought, in particular Indian thought and culture. 1964 is a very important work of Panikar, Essentials of Indian History, and is a, is a wonderful treatise where it defines culture as a complex of ideas, conceptions, developed qualities, organized relationships, policies that exist generally in a society. Professor Surya Narayan Mishra identified five important uh, uh, features of Indian culture by Panikar. They are tradition of tolerance, sense of synthesis reflected in uh, racial harmony, universal outlook, philosophical outlook, respect for the individual. These are the five major uh, points stressed by Professor Surya Narayan Mishra. Then uh, Panikar is uh, often privileged. Uh, I'm calling him an ambassador of Indian culture and uh, his text is mentioned and his literary writings also prove his, uh, his uh, aspect is uh, uh, his own uh, ambassador. He proves his an ambassador to Indian culture. He acknowledged the eloquence of Indian knowledge system throughout his writings. And he cherished a modern outlook endowed by the Oxford Exposition. And uh, we can, uh, I already told, we can decipher easily harmonious blend of Asian ancient ideals and modern outlook in Panikar. Now, uh, I'm concluding my paper. Panikar is not uh, Shakespeare's Caliban. Caliban is a very uh, naughty uh, character in uh, Shakespeare's Tempest, whose profit is in, in learning a foreign language just to curse the colonizer. Rather, not, unlike Caliban, what Panikar is doing, he utilized his English education to view and analyze India and her varied dimension. And uh, Panikar has set it in an enlarged framework and this canvas became grandiloquent. Uh, uh, people are uh, scholars also, his fame is only confined to Asian Western dominance. The, his, uh, actually, the whole writings of Panikar shall be studied in depth to understand the greatness of Panikar. And we can also, in Panikar, we can see a wonderful confluence of social sciences and humanities. He's a unique legend, a keen observer, a vibrant thinker, believer in pragmatism, and is truly one of the builders of India as a nation. He studied the past, lived and interacted with his milieu, and predicted on prospective India in defense, politics, and education. Despite the criticism of his Chinese, British, Hindu bias, the thoughts of Panikar cannot be overlooked as the simple ravings of a historian. The compartmentalization of Panikar as a leftist is to is a fallacy because he viewed everything beyond categorical binaries. He's a trailblazer in all walks of his life and left a legacy for the posterity to nourish and develop. I'm not saying uh, uh, Panikar's ideas are error-free. Obviously, there is nothing perfect in this world. He, he shall be put to, uh, uh, what I say, as the test of critical evaluation.
rather than uh, uh, finding out uh, he has this bias and he has uh, this problem uh, uh, he his contributions he stands and ravished in his global outlook as well as nationalistic uh, con uh, uh, con consciousness sardar panik is not only nationalist but an internationalist this is a contribution uh, the words by chako in fact the pseudonym he take for his letter writing is kerala putra meaning the son of kerala it is an injustice to kerala categorize him as a historian or diplomat alone indeed his scholarly wisdom in various branches nourished one another historical consciousness often intimated the need for naval supremacy in indonesian statements experience created various political treatises and it developed his diplomatic life therefore he is a versatile genius who studied analyzed and thought on various aspects of the life of his time as the well last the as well as history panikkar is an epitome is a typical example of english educated intelligentsia of the commonwealth committed towards the welfare of india his social cultural consciousness is truly national and global at once and he is a true uh, uh, retort or a reply to contemporary fanaticism or a fad for stem education he is an ordinary person from a rural household in an island like village in kerala studied history from oxford and later adopted very many uh, coveted posts for any aspiring scholar and administrator is an example on the potential of liberal education he demonstrated the worth of critical thinking and perseverance in his oeuvre no wonder narendra nath's biography is included in the in the series of uh, 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 builders of modern india book by the ministry of information broadcasting government of india back in the 1990s uh, lastly i would say that the legacy I, I already told there is a legacy left by panika the legacy left by panika can be revamped through academic pursuits like the present conference of icwd finally i would like to reiterate the words of kg saidain is panika's own student that panika is not a person but a phenomenon a phenomenon of intellect and, and energy and drive and versatility that is a uh, uh, panika uh, can be called a uh, 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 truly a versatile uh, genius uh, this is my uh, paper where i try to establish uh, uh, the versatility of uh, panika just a, uh, it's, a, it's a critical overview of uh, the many aspects of the person uh, in, in a nutshell thank you thank you dr pranche for uh, um, patiently listening uh, uh, despite i don't have my slides with me <laughs> thank you very much dr rajan that was what wonderful so my thanks to um all three of of our speakers for their for their presentations uh for engaging us in the work of km panika in these in these different ways through the lenses of your individual disciplines and areas of of expertise um uh, professor ray um really taking us through the uh, the historian came panika the historian specifically um uh, his contributions to maritime history as well as historiography um uh, professor bratton looking at it from the viewpoint of 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 uh, the indian ocean region security strategy also mentioning diplomacy and um uh dr rajan the kind of this this intellectual history this kind of holistic view and i i particularly appreciated um the effort you made to situate him um within a malayalam a literary tradition and the the various contributions he did there beyond kind of academic um uh, scholarship um through which he is most familiar to to people like me so i really appreciate seeing this this additional um as as you put it this versatility and it's it's it's, it's truly a testament i think to to panika's scholarship that it prompts such a depth of engagement from such very different um angles and viewpoints and if professor uh, ilias could have been with us i think we would have had a fourth angle and perspective on it as well um and it's really quite quite humbling that you know more than half a century uh, later this work can still produce these this kind of engagement and these kind of insights um especially as you know we are so aware our days of how quickly um old certainties are replaced how quickly scholarship evolves 
um, and also how scholarly fashions come and go at a, at, at, at a seemingly ever more rapid pace. Um, but as a historian and a medieval historian, no less, I would certainly be careful, be wary, uh, not to speak of, of his work as, as timeless, as I think Professor Ray um, you know, situated for us so, so beautifully. It was very much of its time, of the historical moment in which he was thinking and working and writing. So I think the reason it still speaks to us today is not because it is timeless, but because our time shares really important strands with um, Apatica's own, own period, the historical moment that he was in. Several of our speakers spoke to those continuities and parallels of inhabiting a multipolar world, one of kind of waxing and waning superpowers, and the role of, of sea routes, maritime trade, but also the coercion, the, the, the kind of maritime power. Um, the, the British historian Andrew Lambert, who works at King's College London, he recently wrote a book about sea power states. And in it, he distinguishes between sea power as strategy and what he calls sea power culture. So in his definition, a sea power is a state in which the ocean is central to economic life and security. But then a sea power culture goes beyond that. It includes a prominent role of the sea in a society's uh, mythology, a society's emotions, and, and the values of a society as well. Um, my own scholarship focuses on Muslim trade networks on the medieval Malabar coast. So you can imagine that I learned off and with and from Panika um, uh, from the very beginning. And all three of our speakers kind of began by situating him within Kerala and kind of his, his viewpoint that was clearly shaped um, by the perspective from, from South India and particularly the Malabar coast, where the sea, as you mentioned, played such a central role. Um, so his bold reimagination of, of Indian history um, in his seminal works, um, a history in which the ocean has been the steward of India's historical fortune, that is a sea power history. Not necessarily the history of a sea power, of India as a sea power, but a history of the power that the sea has exerted on the land and kind of breaking down this, this dichotomy, this, this false binary between um, maritime and, and terrestrial or territorial. And this vision then opened up these geopolitical insights that all of you spoke to, um, especially, and I, I found that very interesting that all three of you uh, pointed specifically to the key importance that, that Panika afforded to Southeast Asia and East Asia as part of India's um, maritime strategy. So this kind of what is now very familiar to us is this kind of the idea of the Indo-Pacific century. But, you know, he did this at a time when you know, Britain was still a dominant sea power, even though you know it was clearly in the in the in the waning phase of power. But really, this this direction towards Southeast Asia and East Asia, specifically uh, the future role of China, um, I think, is something that you know clearly um, uh, many many people, especially in Professor Bratton's field, are still still grappling with. So as a historian, it will be no great surprise that I read K.M. Panica above all as a, as a historian, but I've so benefited from, from looking at him through, through your eyes and through those perspectives as well. So I want to thank you all, all our panelists for sharing your insights, your expertise. And I'd like to open up the floor, um, for, for questions. Um, maybe to ask questions, if you could use the raise hand feature, um, which I think is hidden under the smiley face emoji at the bottom of your screen. 
And um, please, in your question, tell us uh, which one of our panelists your question is addressed to. If that is not working for you, then just kind of gesticulate at the screen and I will try to, to pick you up. So thank you again, and I'll open the floor for questions. Yes, uh, Dr. Latif. Sorry, I think you're still muted. If you could unmute yourself and ah, there you go. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for taking my question. This is a mischievous little question for Professor Bratton. Professor Bratton, if Panikkar had been alive today, what would you have said to President Xi Jinping? Sorry, very undiplomatic. Ambassador, <laughs> Argon, do forgive me, but I'm not a diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very mischievous question. Uh, um, it's, I'll, I will attempt to an answer this in an unsatisfying and roundabout way, I guess I could say. Um, I, I've read through, you know, not just my talk highlighted Panikkar's sort of geopolitical uh, writings for the general, for sort of an intellectual elite audience during the mid-1940s. I've read a fair bit of Panikkar's uh, analysis back to Nehru and uh, back to South Block and so on in the, in the archives. And it's really interesting because as some of the other speakers have said, um, because of this the con, you know this contested history with China and Tibet, right? There's a whole group of sort of Panikkar bashers, or Panikkar was a you know he looked just like Lenin, so he must have been a communist sort of <laughs> sort of cottage industry that exists out there. And his his analysis of China is really quite interesting. It's very nuanced, um, not always uh, not always correct. In fact, sometimes Nehru would chide some of his other friends that you know uh, if. If Penneker would speak with uh, X number of people for six months, he would always take their perspective for something. But I, I think in many ways, in terms of Xi Jinping, I, I think there would be, I think Penneker would have this sort of nuanced view of that there is China. Uh, China is a very large and powerful country right now. Um, and China has areas of divergence um, from India. And China has, I think he would say, he would see still areas of convergence between India and China. And then to have this sort of a sophisticated, balanced approach to how India should sort of deal with China, uh, not necessarily in uh, always a confrontational, hawkish, you know, join with the United States, but not necessarily in a whole a whole sort of India China brothers sort of speak uh, from the 1950s but I think he would have a sort of a balanced perspective or try to have a balanced perspective um, I, I've, I've often been quite intrigued reading his writings um, and he would write these really long reports back uh, to Nehru both when he was um, in nationalist China and then in communist China so uh, that's not a very satisfying uh, probably answer uh, but I, I think his views um, as has been well demonstrated by the other press presentators uh, tonight, um, or today, I should say for you, um, really complex, really very nuanced uh, views uh, that he had. Over. Thank you, Professor. Professor Ray, you have a comment or? Um, if I can follow up on that question um, uh, to Professor Bratton. Um, I would be intrigued in what he thought about uh, China's political order, since he believed that it was a liberal order which would be essential for peace. And since he lived through the communist um, regime, he was the ambassador. Um, what did he think about it? And you know, I mean, since you've seen his private papers and his, uh, not his private papers, since you've seen his uh, correspondence, um, um, that would be really interesting. It's complicated. Um, so I think for, and, and again, this is, this is uh, you know, trying to simplify a lot of things. Um, 
I think the, the key to remember is that he came to nationalist China in the waning days of the Civil War. And so it's really quite interesting reading his diplomatic cables from then because, you know, he's really a diplomat without the ability at that time to actually be a diplomat, just given the, the rigors of the Civil War and how isolated the diplomatic community was in China at that time. And so he actually has these rather sort of existential uh, writings back to Nehru and, and, and so on in Delhi saying, you know, I can't really see anybody and there's no power anymore and there's no cocktail parties to go to and I, I don't even get mail anymore. So how am I actually supposed to perform my role as an ambassador uh, under these conditions? Right? They're, they're quite interesting. So I think when the communist regime comes in and Mao comes in, uh, I think there is this sort of headiness, right, in his view that while while this is not necessarily a liberal China, this is this is a, a China on the move. This is a China that is capable of doing things. This is a China that perhaps can play a larger role in a sort of larger, either non-aligned or Afro-Asian sort of way with India. And I, I think as well, his sort of, or, you know, he had a good, at least what he felt was a good relationship with the Chinese leadership. And he felt that he was a conduit, you know, back to India and back even to the United States when it comes to the Korean War and things. So I, I think he has, you know, a nuanced view of China, perhaps, again, with this sort of a, how should I say, a kind of bubble, a diplomatic bubble that he was in even later on during uh, communists, during the, the CCP's uh, regime, where he perhaps did not always have the necessarily the most accurate views of China. So there's kind of a funny, I'm going to wander for a bit. There is this kind of interesting meta dialogue that happens when the U.S. ambassador in Delhi is talking with Bajpai. And Bajpai and, and Henderson, and Lloyd Henderson would talk and, and Henderson would say, well, you know, Panneker, you know, he seems to have this really positive view about China. And you have Bajpai telling the American ambassador, oh, well, you know, you can't trust Panneker. He's just totally biased for China. You know, we don't really think that. And it's really quite interesting. You have, you know, the, the, the foreign secretary, someone uh, talking to the American ambassador saying, well, our ambassador in China doesn't really understand China. So don't listen to him, you know, listen to me and I've got some better information for you. So again, that's what I mentioned, the sort of ripple uh, that he caused were, again, not being a professional, how should we say, from the diplomatic corps, um, was not always seen as being reliable or trustworthy by sort of the the old guard of sort of the administrative services or for the foreign service. So it's, it's an interesting view, but I, I think what came across to me reading it was, again, both because of the Civil War and Nationalist China, and then also the nature of the of the regime, um, he often did not have the access to viewpoints that were always as accurate. Uh, it, it, that's a simplification. I hope that helps. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Raghavan? Well, thank you. Thank you for three wonderful uh, presentations. I didn't really have a question, but uh, two brief comments. Uh, Firstly, Dr. Rajan, thank you very much for that uh, uh, paper. And it really made me think about uh, a general issue in Indian intellectual history, especially uh, one concerning the second half of the 20th century, which is the lack of uh, bilingual and trilingual uh, intellectuals, and which is why we are so astonished with Panika's uh, truly uh, versatile uh, achievements uh, today. But in his time, possibly a scholar, uh, someone who was uh, involved in uh, uh, you know, various day-to-day uh, -day issues, whether as a teacher or as a, a civil servant, but would nevertheless have a knowledge of history and a good knowledge of a regional language or a national language, plus uh, a very good grounding on in Sanskrit was not so much surprising then uh, as it has uh, become uh, today. So I think Panikar as representative of that uh, very wide fraternity of uh, bilingual and trilingual scholars is something to be kept in mind. And thank you for reminding us of that uh, in your uh, paper. Uh, I think the question which Professor Ray and Dr. Bratton raised about Panikar, uh, it is true that Panikar's reputation uh, suffered a great deal, 
because of what was seen as a flawed approach to uh, to China and uh, the debate on that in many ways uh, still continues but it also is part of a wider debate which was there in the indian uh, diplomatic thinking in the 1950s uh, about uh, uh, diplomats who had joined the ministry of external affairs through the stream of the indian civil service and who had served uh, pre independence in uh, uh, in some form or the other either in the indian political department or in other departments which were concerned with uh, uh, the indian uh, diasporic uh, footprint in other countries there was there were those stream of civil servants plus there were others who had come in either through polit- politics or because of service in uh, different uh, princely courts uh, and panikar learned his diplomacy in in jammu and kashmir and bikaner uh, and i think uh, professional civil servants the ics always saw him as more of a courtier than a diplomat and i think that left a certain uh, uh, imprint on his uh, subsequent evaluations which we still have to come to an objective judgment to about to what extent it was a fair uh, evaluation so i would really be interested in knowing whether you are writing a biography of uh, panikar where uh, possibly we will then have a chance to delve in greater detail into these issues thank you very much and maybe i can add to this a uh, question from the chat there are a number of questions in the chat here um but maybe uh what fits quite well here is a question from dr sanjeev kumar um to dr bratton and uh dr kumar asks you talked about panikar's idea of china as a benevolent hegemon of asia do you agree and could you please explain further uh, all Dr. sorts of fun, uh, all sorts of fun questions <laughs> um i you, you know the, the the tricky thing you know if we get into definitions of what is a benevolent hegemon or not right and normally it how do i say it's normally large powers that tend to think of themselves or other large powers as benevolent hegemons right so they say an american conception of the benevolent hegemony would be different than say many latin american states would think of sort of american hegemony right or same again we can think about uh you know the the feelings of many south smaller south asian states having india as a big brother and we can think of the nepalese example of yams between rocks or whatever you want to want to talk about so i i think that's tricky right so i th- i think like panakur like nehru there was this this vision right of india and china as being sort of the, the role models or the the you know the the leading actors and so the world would again come back to how it was before this european interruption right so this you have this european interruption then you would go back to a sort of larger asian sense of of history and again i'm making a simplification and i think panaker still would have felt that way uh that he, that was just a reality you had to work with china that china was a large country and india would be like china so i think in a sense it's it's a very nuanced view perhaps in 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 some ways he was a bit too if i'm to put my own you know judgment x number of decades later perhaps slightly a little bit too optimistic about china um but given the time period in which he was looking at i mean you can understand why this was very indicative of the time um so that's probably my my non answer if you will thank you dr rajan you uh, had a a comment as well no uh, y- y- yes uh, dr french yeah, i i would um um i talked with um uh, dr professor ray that about uh, she has shown a map of travancore um uh, that uh, there is a prop- uh, she mentioned that uh, travancore is actually uh and having lots of water and uh, uh, those uh, statements she has made uh professor ray can you hear me yes i can Wait. yeah go ahead ah uh, ma'am uh, you have mentioned them that travancore is actually the map is uh, travancore is little bit up to cochin 
And yes. uh, you, uh, you, you also mentioned that uh, Travancore is having uh, lots of water. Yes. Uh, water is, uh, water, uh, Travancore uh, is actually uh, the area where uh, Kavalam, Kavalam Panikar's native home is situated. Uh, it is in Alapura district, currently Alapura district in Kerala, where it is more uh, watery. So much water is there. The other uh, uh, areas in Travancore is uh, just uh, uh, land, land one. Uh, but where uh, Panikar was living, the native's village, it has, uh, uh, it is surrounded by bark waters and uh, there is a story behind it. Uh, you can read in the autobiography also. Uh, and also the, uh, the, in that um, map also, Travancore is uh, up to Cochin. From Cochin to downwards, it, it goes somewhere near to the current uh, Kanyakumari. Cape Comorin, uh, uh, that was the princely state of Travancore at that time. It was just a, a, a suggestion. Uh, a um, thank you. Um, I think uh, you missed my comment that I made. And I mm -hmm. said that uh, Panikar was born in Kavalam, yeah. uh, which was in the princely state of, of Travancore. Yes. And uh, in his autobiography, he talks about his uh, birthplace, which is Kavalam, uh -huh. which where water dominated yeah, land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I am very well aware that uh, all of Malabar is not water. So uh -huh. thank you for pointing that out. But uh -huh. my, you know, I was talking about, um, okay. uh, I have read Panikar's autobiography. Okay. And uh, I was quoting from his autobiography about, you know, how he, uh, how he thinks back on uh, his childhood and the water mm -hmm. and the boats and how he travels. So that was my point, but thank okay. you. Okay, no, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, also from the chat, a uh, question for, um, I take it for Professor Ray, it's not specified, but since she's our expert on, on this topic, the question is, why did the Cholas not turn towards the Arabian Sea and the Red Sea? Okay, thank you. That's an interesting question, which I've never come across before. But thank you for asking. Um, the um, If I can sort of shift back and look at the pre-Chola period and start from, say, the 9th century, um, the one of the major uh, one of the major um, developments in South India was that of the merchant guilds. Now, um, uh, these merchant guilds, um, uh, and Professor Prange has written on it and is also aware, also uh, involved Muslim traders, um, you know, the Anjuvanam, uh, as well as traders from Arabia. But uh, these guilds traded largely with Sumatra, um, Indonesia, and with, uh, you know, all the way up to China. So uh, uh, both Burma, uh, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, and China. And um, the, I would not, I would not like to um, look at the Cholas as a dynasty, but much more as a period. And so the period that we are talking about, say between the 9th and the 14th century, had several partners trading both uh, in the Western Indian Ocean and also in the Bay of Bengal. And um, um, these, these organizations, and correct me if I'm wrong, Professor Prange, these, uh, these organizations had different kind of structures. And certainly in Southeast Asia, you see more of Tamil merchants, Tamil guilds uh, than you do in um, the Western Indian Ocean, which is kind of different from an earlier period. But, you know, that's another story. So... Um, uh, I think it's the it's the network of trade and trading uh, groups, uh, which uh, largely um, had a um, was taken up and uh, recycled or represented as the Chola invasion. I hope I've answered that. So thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if I can just add one more question on this um, from the. Uh, from the chat as well. It asks if uh, Dr. Panika delved on the topic of state formation in Southeast Asia with the assistance of trans-oceanic religious institutions. Um, he does not, like I, I mentioned, that um, which I find surprising, neither he nor Nilkan Shastri nor many of the other writers of the Greater India Society, uh, they don't talk about Buddhism at all. 
uh, whereas we find that Buddhism was a major influence, um, um, you know, in in large parts of Southeast Asia. Um, so um, I am not very clear why uh, that happens, um, but I would argue that um, because they are taking up from the colonial discourse, uh, which talks about uh, the splendor of the temples and the splendor of the architecture, you know, they automatically um, take on what they call as the Hindu period. Um, so um, uh, there is no reference to state formation. He does, he talks about the Chola invasion and uh, he talks about the, uh, the naval policy um, of the Cholas and the fact that um, um, the Cholas um, and, you know, they, they, that's the kind of policy that independent India should follow. So he's not looking at, you know, or he's not analyzing the history of Southeast Asia. He's presenting a model uh, from the past, which he says is what India should follow, um, you know, in the in the post-independence period. So that will be my response. But thank you for the question. Yeah, I think the the, the view was very much um, what, we, what we might call state centric, rather than thinking about okay. um, what today we might call kind of soft power of of you know, religious yes. institutions <laughs> and merchant networks and kind of cross cross cultural exchanges. So this was a you know. Yeah. Much more of its time with the state as the decisive agent in these uh in these movements. Um yeah. And this is true for the Western Indian Ocean. Sorry, uh, would you like to add on the Western Indian Ocean and the Arab network? I mean, since you worked a great deal on that. Yeah, no, I think I think you are you are correctly uh you're you're absolutely correct in in the term that the guilds did not play um a, a role in the they played a limited role on the west coast but um not in the maybe in the coastal trade and then you know into into the bay of bengal but we don't really have any any yeah. significant evidence of them trading across the the western indian ocean the arabian sea yeah so i think i think your sense there is correct thank um you. thank you very much um and then I have uh, one more question here from the chat. I don't see any hands. I hope I'm not missing anyone. So I got one more question um, from the chat for uh, uh, for Dr. Breton, and then maybe one question for everyone or anyone who wants to engage with it. So I, I, I read them both out. This one is from Radhika Session. We asked Dr. Breton, where would you locate Panika's geopolitical views in relation to those of Mackinder and his heartland theory? And then uh, a general question, um, what, if any, is the relation between democracy and sea power? That is very interesting. So I'll let anyone have a go at that one, but maybe Dr. Breton can start us off. Interesting. So there, there is definitely... There's definitely, while I think on one hand, I think the line or the connection or the influence, whatever you want to call it, between uh, Mahan and Panikkar is there. And of course, it's very evident in the subtitle of the book. I, I think there also is this engagement with Mackinder and other later thinkers within the sort of continentalist worldview or mindset. Because again, Panikkar proposes, right, that the Indian Ocean is different from the other major oceans, that it is has more characteristics with a closed sea than a large open ocean like the Atlantic or the Pacific. And so this ability or the, the complications of having physical terrestrial geography that interacts with the ocean geography, if you will, and the implications of that are very important for Panikkar. And so, again, not to say that the we're seeing exactly the same sorts of things, um, but you can think about how people talking about, you know, is China trying to solve the Malacca dilemma by doing the Belt and Road Initiative and no longer being subject to sea lanes and things like that. I mean, th those are sort of similar sort of themes that you see in Panikkar. So it's not just it's all sea power and it's all the ocean, but very much aware that particularly in the Indian Ocean and into Southeast Asia, that the terrestrial terrestrial power, for lack of a more sophisticated term, is very important. And this interaction between the two. Uh, so it's very much you, you could probably see Panikkar as, you know, having influences from both Mahan and Mackinder and others as well. Um, 
uh, in his thinking. So I, I think that's very much part of it. Um, so I think I think at times we've perhaps over oversold, if you will, the sort of Mahanian influence on, on Panneker. I mean, I think he was a very widely read person. Um, and so there's other things uh, and his own ideas and his own experiences in there. Uh, so that's that's kind of my view. Um, in terms of democracy and sea power, um, <clears throat> one way that I, I kind of think about it uh, is sort of Jeff Till's idea, not so much that sea power and democracy go together, but perhaps sea power and liberalism go together, or trading values, he calls them, right? That there are certain aspects of trading states uh, well, that might not, say, line up exactly with our present 21st century concept of liberal democracy, tends to have sort of themes that go through. So sea power states have trading values, which tend to overlap with our modern conception of sort of liberal values. And I think that that's, I think in some ways, uh, I think a somewhat helpful starting point. Again, not to say that it's the exact answer, but it's something that I tend to think about when I look. Uh, and, and again, the sea power states book that you mentioned uh, earlier, again, has some of these aspects as well. So I mean, hopefully that's something to at least uh, get the ball rolling. Thank you. Anyone else would like to? Can I? Yeah, Professor Ray, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the um, um, themes that comes across um, uh, in Panika's writings, um, uh, as um, Dr. Bratton said, is the relationship between trade and openness. Um, you know, that before the Portuguese came and controlled trade, there was a certain openness, the, the sea lanes were free. And uh, um, you know, uh, trade was be was being carried out, and the, and that's where he makes also the point that in the Western Indian Ocean uh, there was this openness. Uh, so it's kind of implicit, not certainly democracy. I mean, that's I think a modern uh, a modern category, and uh, um, um, but certainly the fact that uh, the sea lanes. Um, require or, or trade or good trading connections require the sea lanes to be free and open. And this is what happened in history, is what he says. Um, you know, one can sort of uh, rethink that, but that's the point that he makes also in a lot of his writings. So, thanks. Yeah, and I think we could extend that, that kind of beyond just this, this the sea lanes, right? I mean, sea powers tend to lack large territory, mm -hmm. large standing armies, um, kind of the, uh, the, the very idea of autarcy is often mm -hmm. unavailable to them. And so they are very, they're dependent on exchange. And that doesn't mean that it's necessarily peaceful or equal exchange, but still there is this element of, um, interaction. And as a result, there's often a, um, an important influence of merchant interests in sea power yes. states. Yes. And, yes. you know, maybe merchants tend to be a bit more pragmatic than um, uh, generals of large standing armies or something like this. But there's, you know, so I, I, I completely agree with Professor Ray. I wouldn't go as far as that they're inherently democratic, but they're perhaps inherently more outward looking and interested in, in or dependent even on, on exchange and interaction. Um, in a way that continental powers don't have to be if they don't want to be, and they often don't want to be. Yes, because they're getting revenue from the merchants. You know, that's the other, they're, they're sort of earning. And all the time, you know, we read in inscriptions that uh, the foreigners are welcome and, you know, we will not, uh, we will not confiscate their property and, you know, we will not harass them because uh, the merchants are also bringing revenues for the state. And uh, so I agree. Thanks. Yeah. And merchants tend to be wary of very powerful yes, states. Yes, exactly. Oh, that's <laughs> they, true. they like that's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, wonderful. Um, I think unless there is any last minute question that I'm privy to here, then um, I would. Ah, oh, sorry. There's uh, uh, Dr. Latif. Yeah, go ahead, please. Just and uh, if you would unmute yourself again doing it all wrong. Sorry, a very, very important question for uh, uh, Dr. Pragya Pandey. 
Uh, Dr. Pandey, since most of us will not be there at ICWA today for lunch, what are you having for lunch? <laughs> She's not going to share it with us. <laughs> what are you having? What are you having? Are you having biryani? <laughs> Just this is actually dinner and uh, post dinner time for some of us. It's actually very late in the night. <laughs> no, and I'm I'm sort of I'm all in awe of Dr. Bratton getting up at 1 30 a.m. Yeah. My goodness. Yes. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Uh, we okay. might we might offer him some chai and paratas for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that, in that spirit, um, thank you all very, very much for these uh, wonderful papers and these these great questions. And I'll uh, hand you back for uh, Dr. Pandey in case she has any uh, further announcements about the proceedings as they will continue after a delicious lunch in which we <laughs> participate vicariously. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Branch, for conducting the session. And thank you to uh, all the three speakers, presenters, uh, for those wonderful presentations and very fruitful discussion. We will now take a break and we will reconvene for the second session at 1400 hours Indian Standard Time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>